Hello, word nerds. Guess what? We are starting the letter B. What? Yep. How'd that happen? So we are at the bottom half of page 88, uh, and that is going to be two episodes. So then the third episode will be at the top of page 89. Not like you care. You don't need to know this stuff. Um, all right. So, uh, geez, I don't know what to say. I haven't even finished really, at the time of recording, I haven't really finished up the letter A. I still have to record the last episode, which I'm going to do with my wife probably um, in a couple days. And I started to record a special episode, which probably is posted by the time uh, you are hearing this. In fact, most of it is probably, maybe, possibly a Patreon exclusive. So if you want to go hear that, go hear that and give me some money for that. Uh, Let's see. I don't know if I'm going to do any other special episodes. Um, I don't know if I'm going to take any days off, so I don't know exactly when this is going to be posting. Uh, But so, uh, yeah, let's see what happens. Um, All right, this is the first one, is the letter B. It is the first form. It is a noun from before the 12th century. 1A, the second letter of the English alphabet. 1B, a graphic representation of this letter. 1C, a speech counterpart of orthographic, and then it shows the letter B. 2, the seventh tone of a C major scale. 3, a graphic divisive, no, That is not what it is. A graphic device for reproducing the letter B. Four, one designated B, especially as the second in order or class. 5A, a grade rating a student's work as good but short of excellent. That was kind of how I was as a student, a B student. 5B, one graded or rated with a B, and there it shows a capital B. Six, something shaped like the letter B. Again, it's capital. Seven uh, tells me it's capital. The one of the four ABO blood groups characterized by the presence of antigens designated by the letter B and by the presence of antibodies against the antigens present in the letter uh, in the A blood group. So that was the first form of B. Now let us look at the second form of B. This these are both lowercase, by the way. Um, this one is an abbreviation for a lot of things. One, bachelor. Two, bacillus. Three, back. Four, bag. Five, bale. Six, bass or bass. Seven, basso. Eight, bat. Nine, I don't know how to pronounce this, baume? Capital B-A-U-M-E. Not sure what it is. Ten, before. Eleven, bible. Twelve, billion. 13, bishop, 14, black, 15, blue, 16, I want to say black and blue, but it's not, it's bolivar, 17, book, 18, born, 19, bottom, 20, brick, 21, brightness, 22, British, 23, bulb, and 24, what is this word, butat? B-U-T-U-T. Uh, oh, yeah. Got to wait till the end of the B's to find out what that is. Now we have B again. This one is capital. It is a symbol for boron. Now we have B-A. The B is capitalized. It is a symbol for barium. Now we have B-A again. They are both capitalized. This is an abbreviation for one, Bachelor of Arts, two, Batting Average, and three, Buenos Aires. Now we have ba, B-A-A. It is an intransitive verb uh, from circa 1586 to make the bleat of a sheep. And ba is also a noun. Ba. Now we have B-A-A, all caps. It is an abbreviation for Bachelor of Applied Arts. Now we have B-A-A-E, all caps, abbreviation for Bachelor of Aeronautical and Astronautical Engineering. Only smart people get those. Um, you know, but if you work hard, you could do it. Now we have, let's see, bail. I think it's how it's pronounced. Bail. B-A-A-L. It is a noun from, uh, where is it? The uh, 14th century. Any of numerous uh, Canaanite and Phoenician local deities. Baalism is a noun which is often capitalized. This is from Hebrew, Hebrew, Baal, which means Lord. And that is spelled B-A apostrophe A-L. 
although I don't know if I call if they call it an apostrophe. Now we have, I think it's pronounced bass, B-A-A-S. It is a noun from 1785. Uh, let's see. It says South African. We have these synonyms boss and master used especially by non-whites when speaking to or about Europeans in positions of authority. Uh, boss. Um, all right. Next we have bathism or bathism. Uh, B-A-A-T-H-I-S-M with a capital B. There could also be an, uh, an apostrophe in between the two A's. This is a noun from 1963. The principles and policies of the Bath or Bath political party of Iraq and Syria characterized especially by promotion of pan-Arab socialism. Bathist, uh, Bathist is a noun or an adjective and I... Uh, I don't know if this is something that even still exists because, again, this book is a little bit old. Um, let's see. This is uh, from the Arabic Hizb... Uh, let's see. What is it? Hizbalbath, which literally means Renaissance Party, and I'm sure I butchered the pronunciation. Now we have Baba, uh, B-A-B-A. It is a noun from 1826. I wish it would just say, like... Uh, the way a baby says bottle, but it's not going to say that. Um, a rich cake soaked in a rum and sugar syrup called also baba o rum or a baba o rum. Uh, yeah, that sounds tasty. This is French from Polish, literally means old woman. Huh? So if what, what just do old women taste of rum and sugar? Maybe. I don't know. I never never licked a woman's arm. That would be weird. Um, all right, now we have Baba Ganoush. I wonder if this is related at all, but I don't think it is. Um, let's see. Baba Ganoush or Baba Ganoush. Uh, this is a noun from 1977. An appetizer or spread made chiefly of eggplant, tahini, garlic, olive oil, and lemon. And I can say from experience that it is tasty. Uh, now we have, let's see, Babasu Baba or Babasa. I'm not. I, I'm still not sure about the umlaut over the u. Uh, we're just gonna say babasu, b a b a s s u. It is a noun from 1917. A tall, pinnate-leaved palm uh, of Brazil with hard-shelled nuts yielding a valuable oil. Maybe we can find some pictures of the palm and the nuts. And the scientific name is Orbignia phalarata. And then it says S-Y-N. I don't know if that's synonym or something similar. Um, Obignia barbosiana. And I am not even going to try the etymology, but I can tell you it's Portuguese and tupi um, and words that mean fruit and large. Now we have Bobbit, capital B-A-B-B-I-T-T. This is a noun from 1923. A person, and especially a business or professional man, who conforms unthinkingly to prevailing middle-class standards. Uh, Bobbitry is a noun, and Bobbity is an adjective. What? Okay, so this is from George F. Babbitt, who is a character in the novel Babbitt, uh, 1922, uh, and that is by Sinclair Lewis, that novel. A person who is a business professional who conforms unthinkingly to prevailing middle class standards. Sure. All right. Our last word for this episode is babble. B A B B L E. It is a verb from the 13th century. First, we've got the intransitive verbs. 1A. To talk enthusiastically or excessively. 1B. To utter meaningless or unintelligible sounds. 2. To make sounds as though babbling. Now we've got the transitive verbs. Number one, to utter in an incoherently or meaninglessly repetitious manner. Number two, to reveal by talk that is too free. Huh? To reveal by talk that is too free. Too free. T-O-O. I really am not understanding what this book is babbling on about. Uh, babble is also a noun. Babble mint is a noun. And babbler is a noun. Uh, so I'm supposed to pick a word that I like the best or I want to pick as the word of the episode. Uh, so let's see. I'm going to pick baba because that kind of cake sounds tasty 
And uh, yeah, so thank you for uh, listening to this first uh, first episode of the letter B. I haven't looked ahead to see how many pages and how many episodes there are going to be, but uh, very soon I plan on uh, planning that all out and what days, uh, which episodes fall on which days and all that. Um, so let's begin the second chapter out of 26 of this podcast. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary, the only podcast read by some, the only podcast where some idiot reads The Dictionary. I figured it out. Uh, So this is actually take number two because I didn't like the other one and I made some big mistakes. So I think Babel was the last word of the last episode. Um, And so I think we're going to start with the word babe today, B-A-B-E. But I do want to say... Uh, At the time of recording, I'm not 100% sure what day these episodes are airing, but I think one of them, either yesterday's or today's, is airing on January 20th, 2020, 120, 2020, and uh, that is my sister's birthday, so happy birthday, Jessica. All right, here we go with the word babe. It is a noun from the 14th century. 1A, we just have the synonyms infant and baby. 1B is slang. We have the synonyms girl and woman. And 1C, we have the slang again, um, a a person and especially a young woman who is sexually attractive. Probably not the most appropriate word to use um, unless you know the person very well. Uh, You know, so be aware uh, when you're using this word. Um, And then uh, this probably isn't um, a big enough definition to, to put in the def, uh, in the dictionary. Um, but when there's a couple, and sometimes people will call their significant other babe. That doesn't have to be man or woman, male, female, whatever. Uh, that's, that's another way that uh, that word gets used. Um, and then we have the number two definition for babe, a naive, inexperienced person, used especially in the phrase babe in the woods. The etymology says this is Middle English, and it is probably of Imit origin. What is Imit? Um, I recently found a page at the beginning of the dictionary that has all of the different um, uh, abbreviations that are used in this book. So let's take a quick look at that to see what Imit means. Stand by. Abbreviations. Where is imit? Um, Imitative. Imitative. Okay. So is that like when you're imitating something? Used probably of imitative origin. Uh, All right. We are going to move on to Babel. Uh, B-A-B-E-L. And the first B is capitalized. This is a noun from the 14th century. I think there was a movie called Babel, wasn't there? Or something? Uh, One, a city in Shinar where the building of a tower is held in Genesis to have been halted by the confusion of tongues. Uh, If I remember correctly, the story was something like they were building a huge, very tall tower for some reason, and I guess, according to this, that they had to stop building it because there were too many languages being spoken by the people who were making it, and there was some confusion, so they stopped. Is that right? I don't know. Number two says it is often not capitalized. Uh, So 2A, a confusion of sounds or voices. I feel like whenever I'm at a restaurant or a bar or any place where there's a lot of people, that's basically all my ears hear is just a bunch of babble. It's even hard for me to hear uh, the people that I'm with. Uh, But as I've said, my ears are terrible. Now we have 2B, a sense of noise or confusion. Let's look at the etymology. This is Middle English from the Hebrew Babel, B-A-B-H-E-L. And that is from the Akkadian Bab-Ilu, which means gate of God. And I think that has to do with uh, when they were building the tower. They, they, I think they were trying to build it to the heavens. They were trying to build a tower to get to heaven. Um, and uh, I don't... I don't really know in reality if this actually happened or if it was just a story in the Bible. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that. But uh, yeah, that's that's Babel. Now we have Babesia. Babesia. B-A-B-E-S-I-A. This is a noun from 1911. Any of a genus 
of sporozoans, no, uh, sporozoans, parasitic in mammalian red blood cells, as in Texas fever, and transmitted by the bite of a tick, called also pyroplasm, P-I-R-O, plasm. Let's see, what else do we want to say? The genus is Babesia, and the etymology says this is New Latin from Victor, how do you say his name? Babies or Babies? It's spelled like just the word babes, B-A-B-E-S. That's his last name. He died in 1926, and he was a Romanian bacteriologist. That's a fun job. Now we have babesiosis. Babesiosis. I, I think this is related. It's a noun from 1911. An infection with or disease caused by uh, bab, babesiosis. What? Babesias. Babesias. Um, that, I don't think babesias is in here, but we do, what, the word we read before was babesia. So, however you want to pronounce that word. Um, yeah, again, that doesn't sound fun. Now we have Babinski, capital B, no, Babinski Reflex, capital B-A-B-I-N-S-K-I. This is a noun from 1900. A reflex movement in which when the soul is tickled, the big toe turns upward instead of downward, and which is normal in infancy, but indicates damage to the central nervous system, as in the pyramidal tracts later in life. It's called also Babinski sign or Babinski's reflex. Um, so that's so fascinating that your big toe is supposed to go one way, but if you have this, uh, if you have uh, damage to the reflex or to the nerves, then it goes the other way. Uh, this is from J.F.F. Babinski. He died in 1932, or she, I don't know, uh, a French neurologist neurologist yeah it goes over to the second line um i'm sure that most of you when you're uh when the sole of your foot is tickled something happens hopefully your big toe turns upward now we have babarusa babarusa b-a-b-i-r-u-s-a uh this is a noun from 1673 a large wild swine of Indonesia. And the scientific name is Babarusa Babarusa. Interesting. Uh, so the first of those is B-A-B-Y-R-O-U-S-A. And the second spelling is R-U-S-S-A. And the word that we're talking about is R-U-S-A. So three different spellings of essentially the same word. Uh, this word comes from Malay. It is from babi, B-A-B-I, which means pig, plus rusa, which means deer. Um, interesting. I wonder why they added deer to that, but I'm going to have to find a picture and post that one. Next, we have baboon. A lot of people know what baboons are, um, but there is another uh, primate called a mandrill that I think looks pretty similar to a baboon. So a lot of people think that a mandrill is a baboon, but it's, uh, it's, it's a different animal. So a baboon is a noun from the 15th century. Any of a genus of large, gregarious primates of Africa and southwestern Asia having a long, square, naked muzzle. Square, naked muzzle? Uh, oh, naked just because there's no fur on it. Also, any of several closely related primates. And um, let's see. The etymology says this is from uh, Middle French babouin, which is from Baboue, B-A-B-O-U-E, which means grimace. So I guess they thought that they looked like they were grimacing all the time, and uh, they called them baboons. Sorry, I have to wipe my nose. All right, next we have Babu. Babu, B-A-B-U, or B-A-B-O-O. It is a noun from 1776. One, a Hindu gentleman. It is a form of address or address corresponding to Mr. Um, and so, yeah, in, in America or in English, we call somebody Mr. something. I'm Mr. Parks, although don't ever call me that because that just sounds way too formal for me. Um, and so in Hindu, they say Babu. 
Or is it, uh, it's Babu. The emphasis is on the first syllable. 2A, an Indian clerk who writes English. 2B, in italics, it says often disparaging. So uh, notate that. This is not something that you want to say. Um, it is an Indian having some education in English. Um, so this is, like I said, Hindi, Babu, and it literally means father. Um, okay, now we have uh, Babul, B-A-B-U-L. The emphasis is on the second syllable. This is a noun from 1780. An acacia tree, uh, widespread in India and northern Africa, that yields gum, Arabic, and tannins, as well as fodder and timber. Uh, I'm not sure if I've heard of this phrase, gum Arabic. Um, I've heard of the word fodder just in general, but in terms of a, a tree, I'm not sure exactly what that is. Uh, but that is what a babul is. Uh, now we have babushka. This is a noun from 1938. 1A, a usually triangularly folded kerchief for the head. 1B, a head covering as a scarf resembling a babushka. Number two, an elderly Russian woman. I'm not sure if I've ever heard of Russian women being uh, called a babushka. I knew they wore babushkas, but uh, that, that one's new to me. This is from Russian. It means grandmother. Oh, okay. It actually means grandmother. And it's a diminutive of baba, which means old woman. Uh, now I need to ask some people... Did you actually know that babushka means old woman? Um, and it's just what they wear. So that's where the, the kerchief for the scarf name came from. All right, we are on our last word of the episode. It is the first form of baby. The other forms are going to move over to the second episode or the next episode. Uh, this is a noun from the 14th century. 1A1, an extremely young child, especially the synonym infant. 1A2, an extremely young animal. 1B, the youngest of a group. 2A, one that is like a baby, as in behavior. 2B, something that is one's special responsibility, achievement, or interest. Something that is one's special responsibility, achievement, or interest? Baby? Okay. Uh, number three is slang, and we have 3A and 3B. So 3A synonyms are girl and woman, and it is often used in address. Hey, baby. Again, not really something that you want to say, especially these days. Not that it was appropriate 40 years ago, but I guess it was more accepted back then, but not, not so much now. Uh, and 3B, we have these synonyms boy and man. So, sure, it goes either way. Hey, baby. Uh, and that one is also often used in address. Number four, we have these synonyms person and thing. Uh, there's an example. Is one tough baby. I've, I've heard one tough cookie, but I don't know if I've heard of one tough baby. Babyhood is a noun and baby-ish is an adjective. So, we have to pick a word of the episode. Um, there were definitely some good ones, but I've always loved primates in general. So, I'm going to pick baboon as the word of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if you missed my one episode where I talked about the evolution of English uh, recently, um, in it I mentioned somebody who contacted me on Reddit thanking me for creating a podcast where I read the dictionary. And they requested that um, I don't interject so much. So I'm trying to be a little bit better about that. As I mentioned, uh, some people, I think, enjoy the interjections because it keeps it a little bit more interesting, hopefully, and hopefully funny on occasion. Um, but I do understand, you know, if you're that type of person who just wants to hear the dictionary, then I will try and keep them uh, to a minimum. But no promises. Sometimes I may go off on tangents, especially when I have uh, a guest with me. We like to talk. Uh, and, you know, it's fun. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Thank you for joining me on this podcast called The Dictionary, the only podcast in the world read by somebody. 
And why don't we talk about some words? First word is baby, B-A-B-Y. It is the second form. If you want to hear the first form, go listen to the last episode. As I've said many times in the past, this is a journey. I hope that you start at the beginning. Um, And we are at the beginning of a new journey. It is the second chapter, essentially, of this big book um, called The Dictionary. And um, let's see what the bees bring us. So this is baby. It is an adjective from 1591. One of relating to or being a baby. I can definitely act like a baby sometimes. Number two, much smaller than the usual, as in baby carrots. Also as in a baby flat top. Also as in take two baby steps. Uh, the, uh, the example baby carrots reminded me of those baby uh, corn on the cobs that uh, Tom Hanks ate in the movie Big. If you've never seen Big, uh, you should go see it. But I love the idea of just eating the little kernels on the the baby corn. Um, I don't know. They're just many things are awesome. They're so cute and weird to me. Big things too. Okay, now we have the third form of baby. It is a transitive verb from 1744. One, to tend to indulge with often excessive or inappropriate care and solicitude, as in babying their only child. That happens a lot with uh, only only children, I guess, uh, but not necessarily. And helicopter parents has become a big phrase recently. There are some problems with that. So if you're a helicopter parent, maybe you should rethink your choices. Number two, to use or treat with care, as in babying a sore knee. Now we have a synonym. It is the word indulge. Now next we have baby back ribs. I want to sing that song. I want my baby back, baby back, baby back. It is a noun from 1954. Meaty pork ribs cut from the lower back rib section. As I've mentioned, I don't eat meat anymore, uh, but I do remember the first time that I had ribs that were smoked, and they were amazing. I'm not gonna lie, Uh, but that I uh, I don't I don't do that anymore. Uh, Next, we have baby blue. Two words. It is a noun from 1859. One, a pale blue, and number two is plural, blue eyes. Yeah, your your baby blues. And next we have baby blue eyes. It is a noun from 1887. A delicate blue-flowered California herb of the water leaf family. Uh, I didn't know that there was a plant that's called baby blue eyes. Uh, There is a scientific name. It is Nemophila menziesi. Next we have baby boom. Two words. It is a noun from 1880. A marked rise in birth rate as in the U.S. immediately following the end of World War II. Baby Boomer is a noun. I'm sure most or all of you have heard this before, the baby boom. Um, My dad was on the early side of the baby boom. He was born in 1950. The war ended in 45, right? So he was relatively early in the baby boom. And I think it went until, I think technically the baby boomers went until maybe... 1970-ish or so. Um, Yeah, it's so interesting because when he was in high school, uh, there was some amount of kids. And then uh, we we ended up going to the same high school because we were from the same town. And then the amount of kids in each class declined gradually and then started picking back up as the kids of the baby boomers started going to high school as well. And so there was this other uptick in how many kids were in uh, in the classes so it was interesting to sort of see how that uh, how that goes you know all because of um, this war it had a huge effect on uh, the population ups and downs it's very interesting how that stuff happens um, all right next we have baby boomlet it is a noun from 1968 a small or secondary baby boom as in the US in the 1980s and 90s so that is exactly what I was just talking about. Uh, I didn't even know that it had a name, Baby Boomlet. Um, but I was born in 1980, and so I am, I guess, on the front end of that uh, that Baby Boomlet. Can I call myself a Baby Boomletter? I don't think that makes any sense. I think technically I'm an Xennial. That's my uh, generation. There's Generation X. There's a, sh- a small Generation Xennial. Then there's... 
I don't know where Generation Y fits in. And then there's millennials and who knows where we are now. Next, we have baby bump. Two words. It is a noun from 2003. The enlarged abdomen of a pregnant woman. And I hope that you are all respectful of pregnant women and don't go randomly touching their bellies uh, without their permission. Uh, Next, we have baby bust. It is a noun from 1966. A marked decline in birth rate. Baby buster is a noun. Uh, Yeah, I'm sure there are reasons for this. I don't know what they are off the top of my head, though. Um, Probably war. When when, uh, people, usually men back in the day, but when people go off to war, there's usually a baby bust. There's, There's nobody to make more babies. Not for a little while, at least. Next, we have baby carriage. This is a noun from 1825. A small four-wheeled carriage, often with a folding top for pushing a baby around in, called also baby buggy. And I, I want to say rubber baby buggy bumper. Uh, baby carriage styles have changed a lot over the, year, over the years. They're, they're very high-tech now, it seems. Next, we have Baby Grand. It is a noun from 1879. It is a small, grand piano. Next is Babylon, capital B-A-B-Y-L-O-N. It is a noun from the 14th century, a city devoted to materialism and sensual pleasure. Well, I've heard of Babylon, but I did not realize that it was devoted to that. Uh, So that's kind of interesting. Babylon is an ancient city of Babylonia. And now we have Babylonian. Um, We have two forms. This is the first one. It is a noun from 1530. One, a native or inhabitant of ancient Babylonia or Babylon. Number two, the form of the Akkadian language used in ancient Babylonia. And Akkadian, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, is A-K-K-A-D-I-A-N. Now we have The second form of Babylonian, it is an adjective from 1553. One, of relating to or characteristic of Babylonia or Babylon, the Babylonians or Babylonian. Number two, marked by luxury, extravagance, or the pursuit of sensual pleasure, as in the Babylonian halls of the big hotel. And that is a quote from G.K. Chesterton. Uh, And I mentioned before, uh, maybe I'll see if I can find where that quote is from in case any of you are curious. We have another example, the Babylonian delights of this city. I got to say, I was not consciously aware that Babylonian meant that. Uh, So now I will I will try and keep that in mind. Uh, Marked by luxury, extravagance or the pursuit of sensual pleasure. Next, we have baby oil. Two words. It is a noun from 1950. A usually fragrant mineral oil that is used especially to moisturize and cleanse the skin. Also, any of various oils used similarly. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to clear my voice. Um, I've changed a couple babies' diapers in the past, but uh, that is not something I have a lot of experience with. So, but I, you know, most of you, especially you parents. Uh, You know all about baby oil. And our next word, which is baby powder. This is a noun from 1853. A fine powder composed mainly of talc or cornstarch that is sprinkled or rubbed on the skin, especially to absorb absorb moisture and relieve chafing. Babies can't put that stuff on themselves, so they need somebody to help. Next, we have baby's breath. Uh, This is a noun from 1866. We have the synonym gypsophilia, especially a perennial herb or an annual herb commonly used in floral arrangements. I have heard of this before. I think I even know what it looks like. The perennial herb scientific name is gypsophilia paniculata, and the annual herb scientific name is gypsophilia elegans. So it's very elegant. And let's figure out where we're going to end this episode. I think we got a couple more. Three three more. Uh, next, we have babysit. All one word. It is a verb from 1944. Uh, first, we have the intransitive definition. To care for children, usually during a short absence of the parents. Broadly, to give care. 
as in babysit for a neighbor's pets. I think most teenagers have babysat at some point. I did it a little bit, not a whole lot. Um, and, you know, it was a good way to, to make some money as a teenager. Now we have the transitive definition, which is to babysit for. Broadly, we have the synonym tend, T-E-N-D, as in babysit houseplants. And babysitter is a noun. And uh, let's see. Next we have baby talk, two words. It is a noun from 1788. 1A, The consciously imperfect or altered speech used by adults in speaking to small children. Uh, It's always funny to see and hear adults speaking baby talk to kids. It's, you know, at one minute they might be having an adult conversation, and then the next minute they might be going, oh, blah, 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 goo, goo, ga, ga, ga. It's like, why, why, why are you talking like that? Um, I think when adults can talk to kids in a normal adult way, they're speech and vocabulary will grow much, much faster. And uh, I can give you a very specific example. My niece, um, her dad basically always just spoke to her like an adult. And so from a very, very early age, she spoke very well in full sentences, big vocabulary. I mean, we were always blown away at some of the words she knows, uh, the words she knew. And even now, there are still words. I'm like, how do you even know what those words mean? And you're using them correctly. I don't even know half those words. Uh, so yeah, baby talk, baby talk, I get it, you know, the first couple of years, but pretty early on, you should probably start using normal speak and they will get it. They'll understand it. That's the thing. Their brains are like sponges. Um, okay, 1B, the syntactically imperfect speech or phonetically modified forms used by small children learning to talk. Number two, oversimplified speech or writing. And our last for this episode is baby tooth. And this is actually the last of the baby words. Uh, It is a noun from uh, 1834, and we just have the synonym milk tooth. Two words. Uh, So, let's see. What do we want to pick as the word of the episode? There were obviously a lot of good ones in here. Um, I think I'll pick Babylonian Um, just because I learned a little bit more about that word. Um, I mean, I knew it was sort of a location, uh, but I didn't know much about it. Um, so yeah, that is it. Uh, thank you. Comment, follow my social medias, leave me comments, send me an email. I've got that too. It's all in the episode description. Join my Patreon if you want early episodes and sometimes exclusive episodes. Leave me a voicemail. Maybe I'll put it in an episode if I like what you have to say. And uh, yeah, until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of this podcast called The Dictionary. If you haven't noticed, I post episodes every single day. Excuse me, I had to burp. And if you want to hear these episodes early, go join the Patreon. Should we talk about some words? Let's talk about some words. The first word is B-A-C, all caps. Uh, This is an abbreviation for blood alcohol concentration. If you were driving buzzed or drunk, um, or even if you weren't, and a cop pulls you over, they might want to check your B-A-C to see how much alcohol is in you. And uh, if you are above the legal limit, you are going to get arrested, and that's going to be bad for you. So don't drink and drive, please, and thank you. Now we have baccalaureate, B-A-C-C-A-L-A-U-R-E-A-T-E. This is a noun from circa 1649. One, the degree of bachelor conferred by universities and colleges. 2A, a sermon to a graduating class. 2B, the service at which this sermon is delivered. Uh, this is Middle Latin, baccalaureatus, which is from baccalaureus, which means bachelor, and it is an alternative of baccalaureus. Um, all right, next we have uh, baccara. Uh, oh, there's no T, actually, so it's baccara, B-A-C-C-A-R-A-T. It's spelled with a T, but the T is not pronounced. We would call that a silent T. This is a noun from 1848. A card game resembling uh, Chemin de Fer in which three hands are dealt 
and players may bet either or both hands against the dealers. Also, a two-handed version in which players may bet on or against either hand. Um, I've definitely heard of this. I always thought it had a... or a, I thought the T was pronounced, so I always thought it was Baccarat. Um, they may have actually mentioned this in a James Bond movie. If I am remembering correctly, it was Casino Royale. I read the book, actually, Casino Royale, and then they finally made it into a movie, and I think they might play this game in that uh, story. I could be wrong, but it sounds right. It seems like something James Bond would play. Uh, but yeah, I thought it was Baccarat, or Baccarat, uh, but it's no T. Okay, we are going to move on to Backy or Backeye. That's how it's pronounced. It is spelled capital B A C C H A E. Uh, both of those pronunciations were good. It is a noun from 1639. One, the female attendants or priestesses of Bacchus. B A C C H U S. Do you know who Bacchus is? Well, we are going to get there soon. Um, now we have the number two definition the women participating in the Bacchanalia. They were called Baki or Bacchae. So is there a male or a term for the men who participated in the Bacchanalia? I don't know. Um, but next we have Bacchanal, or I guess the uh, well, lots of different ways to pronounce this. Bacchanal, 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 different forms. Uh, B-A-C-C-H-A-N-A-L. It is the first form of two. It is a noun from 1594. Uh, all right, this is maybe a time when uh, the kids might want to turn this off uh, and let the adults th- listen. 1A, we have the two definition for the word orgy. We're not going to get into that. 1B, we have the three definition for the word orgy. 2A, a devotee of Bacchus, especially one who celebrates the Bacchanalia. And then 2B, we have the synonym reveler. R-E-V-E-L-E-R. This is Latin, and it means uh, Shrine of Bacchus. And it is probably a back formation of the word Bacchanalia. I'm sure there are different ways to pronounce Bacchanalia, too. Um, All right, now we have the second form of Bacchanal. That's the way that I'm used to saying it, so that's how I'm going to say it. It is an adjective from 1550 of relating to or suggestive of the Bacchanalia. And Bacchanalian is a synonym. Here we go with Bacchanalia. It is a noun from 1591. Uh, Number one is plural and capitalized. A Roman festival of Bacchus celebrated with dancing, song, and revelry. Number 2A, we have the uh, the number 2 definition for the word orgy. And 2B, again, we have the number 3 definition for the word orgy. Uh, There's a pattern here. And a bacchanalian is an adjective or a noun as well. Let's see. We're not at the word Bacchus yet, so hold on. Uh, but we we got a few more words first. Um, bac- bacant is next. Could also be Bacant. B-A-C-C-H-A-N-T. It is a noun from... There's so much information before the year. Uh, 1699. And we just have the synonym Bacchanal. And Bacant or Bacant is also an adjective. Is there any etymology we want to say? It is, uh, let's see, from, uh, let's see, Latin bacari, which means to take part in the orgies of Bacchus. And now we have bacant again, or bacante, bacanti. Uh, so it's bacant with an E at the end. It is a noun from 1579, a priestess or female follower of Bacchus. Bacant, bacanti. And we are going to move on next to Bacchic, B-A-C-C-H-I-C. And this one is an adjective often capitalized from 1669 of relating to or suggestive of Bacchus or the Bacchanalia. I had no idea that there were so many words related to Bacchus. Um, Bacchanalian for this one is also a synonym. And finally, with the Bacchus words, we are at the word Bacchus, capital B-A-C-C-H-U-S. It is a noun from the 14th century. 
the Greek god of wine, called also Dionysus. And I think Dionysus might be the, uh, was it the Roman name, if that's correct? I remember learning about this freshman year um, uh, English class. Yeah, because I think we read the Odyssey and related texts. uh, And so we learned a little bit about the Greek and Roman gods and such. Uh, So yeah, that's who Bacchus is. Bacchus was the Greek god of wine, and so obviously that was all about partying and Bacchanalia, so uh, yeah, that's that. Um, All right, a little bit more for this episode. Uh, Next is Bach, B-A-C-H, could also be spelled B-A-T-C-H. This is the first form of two. It is an intransitive verb from 1865, to live as a bachelor. Interesting, Bach. Um, it is often used uh, with the word it. So, bock it. Uh, so, if you're living as a bachelor, you are bocking it. That's interesting. Um, all right, now we have this second form of bock. It is a noun from 1925. This one is from New Zealand. Um, it is a small house or weekend cottage. Cool. Didn't know that. Uh, maybe I can find a picture. Maybe there's a, a, a typical style of a a New Zealand Bach that uh, I want to see what it looks like. Um, All right, next we have bachelor. It is the first form of two. This one is a noun from the 14th century. One, a young knight who follows the banner of another. I didn't know that's what they were called. Number two, a person who has received a degree from a college, university, or professional school, usually after four years of study, as in Bachelor of Arts. Also, the degree itself, as in, received a Bachelor of Laws. I guess I thought it was just Bachelor of Law. I haven't even heard that one. Bachelor of Laws. It's plural. Um, I actually have a Bachelor. I guess it's a Bachelor of Fine Arts. Uh, So, yeah, I I got one of those thingies there. Uh, Now we have 3A, an unmarried man. 3B, a male animal without a mate during breeding time. So sad. A bachelor, a bachelordom, but how do you pronounce that? How do you, where's the emphasis? Bachelordom, that is a weird word. Uh, that is a noun, like I'm living in bachelordom. And uh, bachelorhood is an easier word to say, and it is also a noun. Here's the second form of bachelor. It is an adjective from 1840. One, suitable for or occupied by a single person as in a bachelor apartment. Number two, synonym is unmarried, as in bachelor women or bachelor parents. Bachelor parent? Oh, yeah, I guess if you're uh, if you're a parent, uh, but you're not married, you'd be a bachelor parent. Um, but yeah, obviously in this case, uh, male, female doesn't really matter. Because usually when we think of bachelor, we think of a man. But here we have the stereotypical female version of bachelor. It is the word bachelorette. Uh, It is a noun from 1896, a young unmarried woman. Uh, But they don't have fancy words like bachelorettum or bachelorettehood. That would be too much of a mouthful. Now we have bachelor's button. It is two words. It is a noun from 1847, a European composite having flower heads with usually blue, pink, or white rays that is often cultivated in North America called also cornflower. Well, I, now I got to look this up and see what this looks like. I've never heard of this. It's just like a baby's breath. They have these weird, like, normal sounding names, but for some reason, like, why why did baby's breath become a thing? And why did, why did they call it bachelor's button? I want to know the etymology of this stuff. Uh, but the scientific name is Centauria cyanus. Uh, so I see the word cyan in there, so it might, might have a, uh, a cyan coloring to it. Now, we have the last word of this episode. It is bacillary, bacillary, B-A-C-I-L-L-A-R-Y. It is an adjective from 1814, one, shaped like a rod, also consisting of small rods. Number two of relating to or caused by bacilli, B-A-C-I-L-L-I. I almost, la- I almost uh, forgot the last letter. So that is it for these words. 
Um, w most of these were related to Bacchus, so I kind of want to pick that, I guess. Uh, yeah, we'll just pick Bacchus as the word of the episode. Um, go, go drink some wine if you are of age, and uh, go have a good time. Uh, and until next time, this is Spencer reading this entire book called The Dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, you lovely word nerds. Thank you for listening to this episode and all of the other episodes that you have and will listen to of this podcast. It's the only one where some idiot reads the dictionary. Uh, let's talk about some words. We are on the third quarter of page 89. Chugging through. All right. This word is related to the last word of the last episode. This one is bacillus. B-A-C-I-L-L-U-S. It is a noun from 1868. One, any of a genus of rod-shaped gram-positive, usually aerobic bacteria, producing endospores and including many saprophytes and some parasites. Um, so that's the end of that sentence. Um, before I get to the rest of it, uh, let's see. There was The genus was Bacillus. Uh, and the para some parasites, or one of the examples, no, no, uh, yeah, one example of the parasite is Bacillus anthracis. Um, maybe that's anth, uh, yeah, it says of anthrax, so that's anthrax or related to anthrax somehow. There was a lot of words in there that I did not understand. Uh, and then at the end of the, the number one definition, it says broadly, a straight rod-shaped bacterium. Um, I could probably find a picture so you uh, see what we're talking about here because um, I want to see it. Number two, we just have the uh, synonym bacterium, especially a disease-producing bacterium. Sounds great. Now we have bacitracin. Uh, no, bacitracin. B B oh, yeah, interesting. There's Okay, yeah. So it's B-A-C-I-T-R-A-C-I-N. Bacitracin. It is a noun from 1945, a polypeptide antibiotic isolated from a bacillus and usually used topically, especially against gram-positive bacteria. I still don't know what a gram-positive bacteria is. This is from Bacillus subtilis, which is a species of bacillus producing the toxin. And it's also from, uh, let's see, oh, oh, the, okay, so it's bacitracin, and the, uh, the tracin part comes from Margaret Tracy, uh, who was, I think it says, born in about 1936, who was an American child in whose tissues it was found. Uh, so they found bacitracin, or bacillus subtilis, in Margaret Tracy, and maybe they didn't know it existed before that? I don't know. Um, interesting. So so Margaret Tracy got this thing named after her, which is always cool, but um, if it's not a good thing, then that's not cool. Okay, now we have the word back. And this, uh, oddly enough, we're three minutes in. This is actually the last word of the episode because we have four forms of it. And there's a lot to read, so let's say them all. Uh, okay, first form. It is a noun from before the 12th century. 1A1, the rear part of the human body, especially from the neck to the end of the spine. 1A2, the body considered as the wearer of clothes. Uh, like, like the shirt off my back. 1A3, capacity for labor, effort, or endurance. 1A4, the back considered as the seat of one's awareness of duty or failings, as in, get off my back, please and thank you. Uh, now we have 1A5, the back considered as an area of vulnerability, as in, the police officer's partner always watches his back. Uh, yeah, if you're in dangerous situations like that, you want somebody to watch your back, because there could be somebody behind you. All right, now we have 1B. The part of a lower animal as a quadruped corresponding to the human back. Uh, 1C, we have the synonym spinal column. 
And actually, after uh, this is very appropriate because after I record all these episodes, I am going to go to my chiropractor because I have back problems uh, that I'm trying to get worked out. Hopefully, I can get them fixed with a combination of uh, going to the chiropractor and stretching and yoga and massages and things like that. And also sitting with a, a, a good posture, which I'm not doing at the moment. So, hey, wisen up and don't sit stupid, stupid. All right, 1D, we have the 1C definition for spine. 2A, the side or surface opposite the front or face, the rear part. Also, the farther or reverse side. 2B, something at or on the back for support, as in back of a chair. 2C, a place away from the front, as in sat in back. Nobody wants to sit in front for some reason. Um... They, they always want to, like, be sneaky and seat in the back. Sit in the back. Um, all right, number three. A position in some games behind the wall, the front line of players. Also, a player in this position. Backed, with an E-D, is an adjective. Backless is an adjective, uh, like a backless dress or shirt or something. Back of one's hand, or back of the hand, means a show of contempt. Back of one's mind means the part of one's mind where thoughts and memories are stored to be drawn on. I feel like most of my life is in the back of my mind, and I can't draw upon it. Um, It's only what's in front of me that I can draw on. And behind one's back means without one's knowledge. And in back of means uh, we just have the synonym behind. So that was the first form of back. Now let's talk about the second form of back. This is an adverb from the 13th century. 1A, to, toward, or at the rear. 1B, in or into the past, backward in time. Also the synonym ago, A-G-O. 1C, to or at an angle off the vertical. 1D, uh, 1D1, uh, it means under restraint. 1D2, in a delayed or retarded condition. And in this sense, the word retarded basically just means slowed. Uh, That is not a word we use uh, when we're talking about a person. Please and thank you. Uh, So I I think that's a delayed or slowed condition. Uh, Let's see, 2A, to, toward, or in a place from which a person or thing came. 2B, to or toward a former state. To see, in return or reply. Now we have the third form of back. It is an adjective from the 15th century. 1A, being at or in the back, as in back door. 1B, distant from a central or main area, as in back roads. 1C, articulated at or toward the back of the oral passage, as in back vowels. Interesting. I'm curious about that. Number two, have returned or been returned, like you brought it back. Number three, being in arrears. Arrears is spelled A-R-R-E-A-R-S, and we have the synonym overdue. Number four, moving or operating backward. Synonym is reverse. Uh, I've mentioned in the past, I hope you've listened to all my episodes, but I've mentioned uh, a few times I like backward speech or reverse speech where you find phonetically what the words, how to say the words, uh, and that is cool to me. Number five, not current, as in the example, back issues of a magazine. A lot of you young people don't even probably know what we're talking about, but there used to be these things called magazines that would be printed up on paper, and if there was a, the not current issues of the magazine would be called back issues, or if the, the ones that weren't available anymore. Okay, number six for the third form of back means constituting the final nine holes of an 18-hole golf course. So those would be called the back nine, and then the front nine are the first nine holes. Sometimes people only want to play nine holes, so they can do the front or the back. And finally, we have the fourth form of back. It is a transitive verb from 1548. 1A, to support by material or moral assistant like, I got your back. 1B, we have the synonym substantiate. 1C, 
to assume financial responsibility for. 1D, to provide musical accompaniment for. And that is often used with the word up, like the piano player will back you up. Uh, or can you play play me some backup? Uh, 2A, to cause, where did it go? To cause, to go back, or in reverse. 2B, to articulate a sound with the tongue farther back. Interesting. Uh, 3A, to furnish with a back. 2B, to be at the back of. Okay, those were the transitive verb definitions. Now we have the intransitive definitions. One, to move backward, often used with the word up. Back up, like I got to back up because I want to see what uh, what's in front of me, but I got to back up. That, that was a stupid example. All right, number two, it's talking about the wind. To shift counterclockwise and compare to the word veer. So when the wind shifts counterclockwise, it's going back, I guess. Okay, number three, to have the back in the direction of something. Synonyms for all of the fourth form of back are support and recede. Backer is a noun, and we have a phrase. Oh, geez, there's even more. Okay, back and fill is a phrase that has a couple definitions. One, to manage the sails of a ship so as to keep it clear of obstructions as it floats down with the current of a river or channel. That definition went on longer than I expected. Number two, uh, to take opposite positions alternately. And I like this synonym, shilly shally. That absolutely has to be in my vocabulary. Um, so would that is that like a, an older form of flip flop? Uh, to take opposite positions al- alternate alternately. Uh, y- when we're talking about politicians, if they take a different position, we often call that flip flopping. Um, but I guess it could also be shilly shally. Back into is a phrase, and that means to get into inadvertently, as in backed into the antiques business. Well, how do you back into the antiques business? inadvertently. I mean, I guess it's possible, but that's an interesting example. All right, so those are all the words for this episode. Most of them were back, um, so I guess back is the word of the episode. Uh, Yeah, thank you for listening. Join me in Keep On Listening. Uh, Become a, a fan of all the social media pages and tell your friends, tell your enemies. Use this as a way to help you go to sleep. And uh, until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. A goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to this episode of the Dictionary Podcast. And um, I very much enjoy that you are here. Um, I hope that I, I wish that I could sit with you and we could have a conversation about the words. Um, maybe we'll do this live someday, but that probably won't happen. Um, all right. So should we say some words? This is the last quarter of page eighty-nine. Uh, I did a little looking ahead, and uh, because I saw that there's a lot of words that start with back, and we have almost two full pages uh, to get through of uh, words that start with back. Uh, so we've already read the word back, and uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be having these words for the next one, two, three, four, five, basically six episodes, including this one. So uh, I hope you are. I hope you like these words. First word for this episode is backache. B a c k a c h e. It is all one word. Uh, it is a noun from 1601. A pain in the lower back. I have that. Now we have back and forth. There is a hyphen in between the three words, and this is a noun from 1941. We have two synonyms. The first one is the first definition for the word discussion. And the second one is the phrase give and take. Now we have back and forth again, uh, but there's no hyphens. It is an adverb from 1613. Backward and forward. Also, between two places or persons. Now we have back away. Two words. It is an intransitive verb from 1833. To move away as from a stand on an issue or back. No. Uh, Okay, so the definition is just to move away. And then, as sort of an example in parentheses, it says, as from a stand on an issue or from a commitment. So if, you're, if you've, uh, you've, got, you've taken a stand on something, but then you 
don't want to have that stand anymore or somebody's pressuring you, uh, you back away. Now we have back bacon. Two words. Uh, it is a noun from 1902. It is chiefly British, and we just have the synonym Canadian bacon, which in, in America, that's basically just ham, but uh, they call it Canadian bacon. All right, next we have backbeat, all one word. It is a noun from 1928, a steady pronounced rhythm stressing the second and fourth beats of a four beat measure. So I'll give you a quick little example. If this is the beat, I don't know if you can hear that. The backbeat would be two, four, two, four. So usually when people are at a rock concert of some kind and they're clapping to the beat, uh, it's usually on two and four, in case you didn't know that. Now we have back bench. Uh, one word. This is f uh, a noun from 1799. A bench in the British legislature as the House of Commons occupied by rank and file members. Rank and file has hyphens in between the three words. Uh, it says compared to the front bench, which I'm guessing is in the front. Uh, back bencher is a noun. Uh, I'm trying to think of what to say about this. I don't have to say anything, but I feel like I should. Um, what was that movie that I saw recently with... Um, eh, whatever. I'm not going to think of enough information, so it's going to be stupid. Okay, we are going to move on to backbite. This is one word. It is a verb from the 12th century. First is the transitive verb definition. To say mean or spiteful things about as one not present. So if you are saying mean or spiteful things about somebody who's not around you, you are backbiting. And now the intransitive definition, to backbite, to backbite a person. And backbiter is a noun. And now we have back block, all one word. It is a noun from 1868. It, so this is a phrase in Australia and New Zealand. And we have the number two definition for boondocks, which is one word. And it is usually used in plural, so back blocks. Um... I have an itch in my ear, and I'm going to scratch it. All right, next we have backboard, all one word. It is a noun from 1761. One, a board placed at or serving as the back of something, especially a rounded or rectangular board behind the basket on a basketball court, which serves to keep missed shots from going out of bounds and from which the ball can be made to rebound into the basket. I think you all know what that is, right? Uh, number two, a stiff board on which an injured person and especially one with neck or spinal injuries is placed and immobilized in order to prevent further injury during transport. I think that would be funny if the backboard uh, on a basketball court didn't look like a normal backboard, but it was actually the backboard that they used uh, when um, they put somebody like on a stretcher. That would be funny to see. Not really. Uh, when I was a kid, we had a basketball hoop put on the back of our garage in our alley, and um, two or three times, somebody pulled down the hoop. They somehow got up high enough to grab onto it. I don't know if they jumped high or got onto it from a car or something, because um, it wasn't when I was there. And they pulled the whole hoop down, but the backboard stayed up there. So for a long time, we just had a lone backboard on the, uh, on the garage. Next, we have backbone, all one word. It is a noun from the 14th century. One, we have the synonyms spinal column and spine. Number two, something that resembles a backbone as, to A, a chief mountain ridge, range, or system. To B, the foundation or most substantial or sturdiest part of something. To C, the longest chain of atoms or groups of atoms in a usually long molecule as a polymer or protein. 2D, the primary high-speed hardware and transmission lines of a telecommunications network as the internet. That's the backbone. Number three, firm and resolute character. And number four, we have the 1C definition for the word spine. Backboned with a D at the end, is an adjective. Next, we have back breaking. 
It is one word. It is an adjective from 1766. Extremely arduous, exhausting, and demoralizing, as in backbreaking labor or backbreaking rents. Backbreaker is a noun. That reminds me of the song um, 16 Tons. We owed 16 tons. What do you get another day older and deeper in debt? Anyway, I think uh, the what they're talking about in that song was all backbreaking work. Now we have back burner. It is two words. It is a noun from 1943. The condition of being out of active consideration or development. Usually used in the phrase on the back burner. Back burner is also a transitive verb. Excuse me, I had some water before and I had to burp. Next we have back channel. It is uh, two separate words. It is a noun from 1975. A secret, unofficial, or irregular means of communication. Back channel with a hyphen is an adjective. Now we have back chat. It is one word. It is a noun from 1894. One, we have the synonym back talk. Number two, gossipy or bantering conversation. And now we have back check. It is two words with a hyphen. It is an intransitive verb from 1913. To skate back toward one's own goal while closely defending against the offensive rushes of an opposing player in ice hockey. Back checker is a noun. So this is, as mentioned, hockey. So if you're facing towards your opponents, but you're skating backwards towards your own goal, I guess that's called back check. So you're still ready to uh, to get to them, but uh, so so you see where you're supposed to go, or you don't you don't see where you're supposed to go. You see what's coming at you, uh, but you're not looking where you're going. I guess. Okay. Next, we have back cloth. It is one word. It is a noun from 1874. It is chiefly British. And it has the synonym backdrop. Now we have back country, all one word. It is a noun from 1746, a remote, undeveloped rural area. Lots of land out in the, the back country there. And I think this is our last word of the episode. It is back court, all one word. It is a noun from 1884. One. The play no, the area near or nearest the back boundary lines or back wall of the playing area in a net or court game. 2A, a basketball team's defensive half of the court. 2B, the positions, I had to flip the page, the positions of the guards on a basketball team. Also, the guards themselves, as in a team with a strong back court. So, those were all the words. I have to pick a word of the episode. Uh, Was there anything that particularly stood out at me? Um, Well, you know, I think I'm going to pick backache, our very first word, because I often have a backache, uh, because like I said, I got some back problems that I'm trying to fix. Uh, So that is the end of the episode. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I'm very pleased to have now gotten onto the bees. Which, um, after my quick little bit of math, I think it should actually be almost exactly the same length as the letter A, uh, give or take a few pages. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's, uh, we, we will be, should be getting to the C's right around the end of the year. Uh, all right, until next time, this is Spencer reading this big book called The Dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary Podcast, the only podcast where I read the dictionary. Uh, Yeah, I only have one podcast like this. I don't have two. Uh, So, let's see. What have we got? Um, Our first word for this episode, we are at the top of page 90. And uh, let me fix this wire because it's making noise. Um, All right, our first word is back court man or back courtman. It is all one word, B-A-C-K-C-O-U-R-T-M-A-N. It is a noun from 1954, a guard on a basketball team. Uh, Now we have back cross, all one word. It is the first form. It is a transitive verb from 1904. To cross, a first generation hybrid with one of the parental types. And uh, part of that is in parentheses. So the full definition is to cross with one of the parental types. This seems like something that's related to genetics. 
Now we have back cross again. It is the second form. It is a noun from 1918, a mating that involves back crossing. Also, an individual produced by back crossing. Uh, okay, so now I'm starting to rethink this, and it seems like, is this when you have a child mate with its parent? When you are um, making, uh, what am I trying to say? When you're, um, what do they call it? When people are um, making purebreds or something like that. They're breeding, they're breeding. Um, so when, I would not be surprised if people do this. They'll, If they're breeding purebred dogs, they'll have the child mate with the parent, which I think is absolutely crazy. Um, okay, but you don't want to hear what I have to say, right? Now we have backdate. All one word. It is a transitive verb from 1944. To put a date earlier than the actual one on. As in, backdate a memo. Also, to make retroactive. As in, backdate pension rights. Uh, I don't make memos, so I don't know about that example. But yeah, I know that um, when you're making checks, uh, sometimes... How did my wires get so messed up here? Uh, sometimes you put a different date on a check, but that's usually a, a forward date, not a back date. Um, now we have back dive, two separate words. It is a noun from circa 1934, a dive from a position facing the dive board. So you go in backwards. Now we have back door, all one word. It is an adjective from 1805. One, we have these synonyms indirect and devious. Number two, involving or being a play in basketball in which a player moves behind the defense and toward the basket to receive a quick pass, as in a backdoor layup. Now we have back down, two words. It is an intransitive verb from 1849, to withdraw from a commitment or position. I got to back down on that date we have. Now we have backdrop. All one word. It is a noun from 1913. One, a painted cloth hung across the rear of a stage. Number two, we just have the synonym background. And backdrop is also a transitive verb. Now we have backfield. All one word. It is a noun from 1903. The football players whose positions are behind the line of scrimmage. Also, the positions themselves. Now we have backfill, one word, transitive verb from 1908, to refill as an excavation, usually with excavated material. So like a, if there's like a quarry and they're taking stuff out and then they fill it back in, that's called backfilling. And now the intransitive verb, to backfill an excavation, I have to sneeze, backfill is also a noun. Let's see if the sneeze happens. Uh, now we have backfire, all one word. This is the first form. It is a noun from 1839. One, a fire started to check an advancing fire by clearing an area. Number two, a loud noise caused by the improperly timed explosion of fuel mixture in the cylinder of an internal combustion engine. I've always heard people talk about how when a car backfires, that it can sound like a gun or something, but I've never really understood what that what is actually happening. And I still don't. Now we have the second form of backfire. It is an intransitive verb from 1886. To make or undergo a backfire. Number two, to have the reverse of the desired or expected effect. As in, their plans backfired. Now we have backfit, F-I-T. All one word. It is a transitive verb from 1967, and we just have the synonym retrofit. Backfit is also a noun. Now we have backflip. It is a noun from 1935. A backward somersault, especially in the air. These are hard to do uh, unless you do a lot of training. I had a trampoline back in the day, and I eventually was able to train myself to do a backflip on it. But you had to be aware of, you know, you don't want to move forward, too far forward or too far backward on the trampoline because then you could fall off, and that is bad. And that has happened um, to me. 
Um, all right, now we have backflow, all one word. It is a noun from 1878. A flowing back or returning, especially toward a source. Now we have back formation. It is uh, two words with a hyphen. It is a noun from 1889. One, a word formed by subtraction of a real or supposed affix or affix from an already existing longer word, as the word burgle from burglar. So the word burgle has been back formed or is a back formation of the word burglar. Number two, the formation of back formations. Now uh, we have our last word for this episode. It's a little bit of a short episode because the next word is right in the middle of the column um, and it takes takes up a lot of space uh, and I don't want to break it up. So backgammon is our last word, B-A-C-K-G-A-M-M-O-N. This is a noun from circa 1645. A board game played with dice and counters in which players try to be the first to gather their pieces into one corner and then systematically remove them from the board. Uh, let's see, this is perhaps from the prefix back, or no, just the word back plus the Middle English word gammon, G-A-M-E-N, um, or also gam, game, G-A-M-E, which means game. So back game is uh, possibly where this word came from. I tried to learn backgammon once, uh, and I couldn't understand it, so I quit. So what is the word of the episode? Uh, let's see, back date, back dive. Um, I'm going to pick backflip as the word of the episode because I think backflips are cool and fun to do when you can do them. And uh, if you want to learn how to do them just on the ground without a trampoline, uh, have somebody help you, and then you can eventually do it yourself. Uh, So that's it. Thank you very much uh, for listening to this short episode. Um, I'm I'm hoping the B's are as interesting as the A's, Uh, hopefully more. I hope that we get more listeners here. Uh, Please leave me a five-star review uh, with positive or negative comments in the review, um, in the written review. I got uh, got one or two more recently, so thank you for that. It really does help. And um, until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of this podcast called The Dictionary. The first word for this episode is background, all one word, B-A-C-K-G-R-O-U-N-D. It is a noun, and it is from 1672. 1A, the scenery or ground behind something. I hope you are all familiar with this word. 1B, the part of a painting representing what lies behind objects in the foreground. Um, I would add on to that that um, it would be behind the objects that are the subject of the painting um, because there could be other objects that are in the foreground in front of that, uh, in front of the subject. But usually, yes, your subject is in the foreground. Number two. An inconspicuous position. 3A. The conditions that form the setting within which something is experienced. 3B1. The circumstances or events antecedent to a phenomenon or development. 3B2. Information essential to understanding of a problem or situation. 3C. The total of a person's experience, knowledge, and education. 4a. Intrusive sound or radiation that interferes with received or recorded electronic signals. 4b. A more or less steady level of noise above which the effect as radioactivity... uh, Where did it go? Being measured by an apparatus as a Geiger counter is detected, especially... A somewhat steady level of radiation in the natural environment, as from cosmic rays. 5. A level of computer processing at which the processor uses time not required for a primary task to ground on an additional task. And then compare to the word foreground. 
So in terms of, com of a computer, sometimes it does tasks in the background, and there are other tasks that it uh, has to do in the foreground, like if you're working on some application uh, actively. Same with um, you know radiation. There's background radiation that's always there, but if it goes above that level, that would be in the foreground, and that's the stuff that you have to be worried about. Uh, we have a short little phrase. It is on background, and that means with the understanding that information offered for publication will not be attributed to a specific source, as in an official speaking on background. So now we have some synonym information about the word background. Um, and I don't think I mentioned this at the beginning, but this is the first form of two. Uh, the second form of background is very short. So here's the synonym information. Background, setting, environment, milieu, mise-en-scene mean the place, time, and circumstances in which something occurs. Background often refers to the circumstances or events that precede a phenomenon or development, as in, the shocking decision was part of the background of the riots. Setting suggests looking at real-life situations in literary or dramatic terms, as in, a militant reformer who was born into an unlikely social setting. Environment applies to all the external factors that have a formative influence on one's physical, mental, or moral development, as in the kind of environment that produces juvenile delinquents. Milieu is spelled M-I-L-I-E... Sorry, let me try that again. M-I-L-I-E-U. Milieu applies especially to the physical and social surroundings of a person or group of persons, as in an intellectual milieu conductive, uh, conducive to artistic experimentation. Mise-en-scene is a French phrase that is spelled M-I-S-E hyphen E-N hyphen S-C-E-N-E. -E. Mise-en-scene strongly suggests the use of properties to achieve a particular atmosphere or theatrical effect, as in a gothic thriller with a carefully crafted mise-en-scene. And I did go to film school, and we talked about this phrase. Um, it would come up every once in a while. Um, and it's basically the idea of what is in the scene, what is in the shot. And so that is um, basically anything that's in the shot. It's um, the, 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 the subject, the background, the foreground, the lighting, what are the specific objects, the production design. So that's when you hear that phrase mise-en-scene, that's what you're talking about. It's, it's what's in the shot, how is it composed, how is it lit, all those things. How does the camera move even? Um, okay, that is it for the first form of background. Now we have the second form of background. It is a transitive verb from 1768, to provide with background. Now we have backgrounder, so they've added an ER. Uh, this is a noun from 1960, an off-the-record briefing for reporters. Next we have background music, two separate words. It is a noun from 1928. Music to accompany the dialogue or action of a motion picture or radio or television drama. Next, we have background radiation. We talked about this earlier. It is two separate words. It is a noun from 1968. The microwave radiation pervading the universe that exhibits a corresponding black body temperature of 2.7 Kelvin and that is the principal evidence supporting the Big Bang Theory, called also cosmic background radiation. For those of you who don't know, uh, back in the day, our old TVs, uh, you could set it to another channel, uh, or to a, a non-channel, I should say, where there's no signal, and you would just get that a thing that we called snow. It was white and black, and it was constantly moving, and it would make a hiss sound. Uh, and that is actually the background radiation uh, that was created when the Big Bang happened. That is um, a, a signal, basically, in the air that um, that the TVs would pick up. There wasn't anything in there. Um, there. There was no TV signal. It's not like you could watch The Simpsons on it. Uh, okay, next we have backhand. It is one word. It is the first form 
Um, it is a noun from 1657. 1A, a stroke, as in tennis, made with the back of the hand turned in the direction of movement. Also, the side on which such strokes are made. And there is a picture for this specific definition, a little black and white picture of a woman playing tennis and, um, and her, uh, her hand, her arm, and the racket are in that backhand uh, formation with the back of her hand uh, going towards the, the, where the movement is. Uh, okay, 1B, a catch, as in baseball, made to the side of the body opposite the hand being used. Number two, handwriting whose strokes slant downward from left to right. Left to right, okay. Uh, now we have the second form of backhand. It is an adjective from 1695, made with a backhand, as in a backhand tennis stroke. Now we have the third form of backhand, could also be backhanded. This is an adverb from 1889. It says, with a backhand. Um, this reminds me, uh, if you were to insult, um, actually, you know what, that's coming up, so I'm going to hold on to that one. Um, all right, next we have the fourth form of backhand. We don't usually hit four forms. Uh, this is a transitive verb from circa 1935, to do, hit, or catch backhand. And of course, I think that's uh, mostly probably related to uh, the 1B definition from before, a catch, like in baseball. Now we have backhanded, all one word. This is an adjective from 1800. One, we just have the synonyms indirect and devious, especially the synonym sarcastic, as in the example, a backhanded compliment. Uh, so that would be when you are complimenting somebody, but in the way you word it, it is also um, kind of a, a dig at them. It's it's the would be the opposite of comp of, of a compliment. Um, you're being mean to them, but you're also complimenting them at the same time. It is an art form to do a backhanded compliment. Number two, using or made with a backhand. Backhandedly is an adverb. And now we have our last word for this episode. It is backhander. B a c k h a n d E R all one word. It is a noun from 1960. Number one is British, and we have the synonym bribe, B R I B E. Number two, a backhand shot. So, what will be the word of the episode? Um, I'm going to pick background radiation as the word of the episode because I think the cosmos is fascinating. Uh, the Big Bang, the planets, the galaxies, all that stuff. I just find that super fascinating, as you've probably heard uh, me talk about before. And um, uh, let's see, I think that's about all we've got. Uh, oh, um, I'm going to try and leave um, most of my comments, um, unless it specifically has to do with what I'm reading at the moment. I'm going to try and leave most of my comments at the end of the episode, uh, because if you are someone who does not like to hear me talk about uh, I guess my life, uh, you can you can end the episode now. But if you want to hear a little bit more about my personal thoughts or things that, that's going on with me, uh, you can keep on listening. Uh, so today is January 27th. It is my niece's birthday. Uh, she is actually 10 today, 10 years old. I remember when I turned 10, I, I thought that I had to have my whole life figured out before I hit two digits. I was a weird kid. I'm a weird adult because I'm reading the dictionary. Um, so I just want to say to my niece, if she's listening, uh, you don't have to have your whole life figured out. People are figuring out their whole life and who they are and what they do to the day they die. And, um, I know that's what I'm doing, um, because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so I think that's going to be the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. And until next time, this is some weirdo reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the Dictionary Podcast. It's my podcast, and I am talking to you about some words that start with the word back. Uh, we got a ways to go with these words that start with back. And our first word for this episode is back ho. B A C K H O E. It is a noun from 1928. An excavating machine having a bucket that is attached to a rigid bar hinged to a boom and that is drawn toward the machine in operation. Now we have back house, 
all one word. It is a noun from 1836, and we just have the 1A definition for the word privy, P-R-I-V-Y. Now we have backing, B-A-C-K-I-N-G. It is a noun from 1793. One, something forming a back. 2A, we have the synonyms support and aid, A-I-D. 2B, endorsement, especially of a warrant by a magistrate. Now we have back judge. It is two words. It is a noun from circa 1966, a football official whose duties include keeping the game's official time and identifying eligible pass receivers. I don't know the rules of all, I don't know all the rules of football or who the refs are and what they all do. It seems like a hard job. Now we have the word backland, all one word. It is a noun from 1681. We have the synonyms back country and hinterland. I like that word, hinterland. It is usually used in plural, so backlands. Now we have backlash, all one word. It is a noun from 1815. 1A, a sudden violent backward movement or reaction. 1B, the play between adjacent movable parts, as in a series of gears. Also, the jar caused by this when the parts are put into action. The jar? Uh, Why is it called the jar? The jar caused by this when the parts are put into action. Well, now I'm curious to get to the word jar and see what other definitions there are other other than just a glass jar that you put stuff in. Uh, Now we have number two. A snarl in that part of a fishing line wound on the reel. Number three, a strong adverse reaction as to a recent political or social development. Backlasher is a noun. Uh, Yes, oftentimes there is a lot of backlash in the political world. Now we have backlight, all one word. It is a noun from circa 1846. Illumination from behind, also the source of such illumination. Backlight is also a transitive verb. Uh, We see things that are backlit often with our phones and watches and various pieces of technology, and uh, it's pretty standard these days. It wasn't as standard many years ago, Um, but uh, yeah, that's a thing. Now we have backlist, all one word. It is a noun from 1964, a list of books kept in print as distinguished from books newly published. Now we have backlog, all one word. It is the first form. It is a noun from 1684. One, a large log at the back of a hearth fire. And uh, yeah, I guess within big fireplaces, uh, they'll put a big log somewhere in there to make sure that it's going for a while because you can use the smaller logs as kindling. Number two, an accumulation of tasks underperformed or materials not uh, processed. That word went over to the second line. Um, As in, a backlog of court cases. Now we have the second form of backlog. It is a verb from 1963, and we have the synonym accumulate as the definition. Now we have back matter. Two words. It is a noun from 1947. Matter following the main text of a book. Next is back mutation. It is two words. It is a noun from 1939. Mutation of a previously mutated gene to its former condition. Next is back of. Two words. It is a preposition from 1694. We have the synonym behind, as in out back of the barn. Uh, So that would be out behind the barn. I think that's uh, not probably used very much anymore. Next, we have the phrase back of beyond, three words from 1816. It means a remote place. Back of beyond, never heard that. Next, we have back off, two words. It is an intransitive verb from 1850, and we have the synonym back down. I'm sure most of us have uh, told somebody to just back off. Next, we have back office, uh, two words with a hyphen. 
It is an adjective from 1953 of or relating to the inner workings of a business or institution. Synonym is internal, as in the example back office operations. So yeah, most uh, corporations, businesses, institutions, whatever it is, uh, they have a lot of administrative work that needs to be done. So that is called back office. Um, You know, either the people, probably an HR department or the people who have to make sure that people get paid uh, or various things like that. Next, we have back order, two words with a hyphen. It is an in, uh, no, it is a transitive verb from 1950 to assign to the status of back order, which is our next phrase, back order, uh, two words, no hyphen. It is a noun from circa 1929. A business order yet to be fulfilled because stock is unavailable. If you do any online ordering, I'm sure you have seen something like this. Item is out of stock, so it is on back order. Next, we have back out. Two words. Uh, It's an intransitive verb from 1807. To withdraw, especially from a commitment or contest. Next, we have backpack. Uh, something that I have owned basically my entire life, although I've gotten different ones of them. Um, This is the first form. It is a noun from 1914. 1A, a load carried on the back. 1B, a camping pack, as of canvas or nylon, supported by a usually aluminum frame and carried on the back. 1C, we have the synonym knapsack. I'm not sure how that's different from the other definitions, uh, but it's a fun word. Number two, a piece of equipment designed for use while being carried on the back. Now we have the second form of backpack. It is a transitive verb from 1927 to carry food or equipment on the back, especially in hiking. And food or equipment was in parentheses. And there is an intransitive definition, which means to hike with a backpack. Backpacker is a noun. Next, we have backpedal, P-E-D-A-L. It is all one word. It is an intransitive verb from 1901, to retreat or move backward. Uh, And I think that could be both either physically or mentally because um, you could be having a conversation with somebody and then you you think that what you were saying was wrong or some way or um, whether you believe it or not. And then you want to backpedal on what you said. And so you, you know, you try and fix the situation. Next, we have backrest. All one word. It is a noun from 1859. A rest for the back. Next is back room. It is all one word. It is a um, adjective from 1940. Made or operating in an inconspicuous way. Synonym is behind the scenes which has hyphens, as in backroom deals or a backroom politician. Next, we have um, backroom again, but this is two separate words. It is a noun from 1592. One, a room situated in the rear. Number two, the meeting place of a directing group that exercises its authority in an inconspicuous and indirect way. And now we have the last word for this episode. It is back saw, B-A-C-K-S-A-W. It is one word. It is a noun from circa 1876, a saw with a metal rib along its back. I'm curious what that looks like. I'm sure I've seen one, but I'm, I'm not sure exactly uh, what that metal rib is or what it's for or what it looks like exactly. Um, so now we have to pick a word of the episode. Oh, so many words that start with back. Um, we shall pick, um, let's see. We'll, we'll just go ahead and pick backlight as the word of the episode because we live in a time when so many things have backlights and, um, there's been a lot of studies on whether or not being on your phone right before you go go to bed is a good or a bad thing. Is it the phone? Is it the blue light? It is, is it, uh, just the fact that you are, 
getting your brain going again in some way right before you go to bed. Um, I have heard that it's not necessarily the blue light. It's actually what you're doing that makes um, it hard to sleep or makes you have bad sleep or whatever it is. So I try and be pretty good about not looking at my phone for like maybe the last half hour before I go to bed, but I'm very bad about it. Uh, So give it a shot. See if you can uh, avoid looking at your phone or iPad or computer or whatever right before you go to bed. Uh, So that is it for this episode. Thank you very, very much for listening. And um, until next time, this is me reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds, and welcome to another episode of the Dictionary Podcast, the only podcast read by some silly person who is me. So, um, there won't be any uh, lacking in episodes. There was a new episode yesterday. There's a new episode today. Um, But I haven't recorded in a while because um, I had a somewhat major foot injury. Um, It wasn't minor, um, but it also wasn't like a break, luckily. Um, But it was fairly major. It put me on crutches. Um, So this is the first time I've recorded in a little while. Uh, So let me see if I can figure out how to do this again. Um, I will give some more information about this foot injury at the end of the episode. Uh, If you are so interested, uh, keep on listening and I will talk about it. Um, All right, so we are at uh, the fourth quarter of page 90 with our first word, which is backscatter, Uh, B-A-C-K-S-C-A-T-T-E-R. It is all one word, could also be backscattering. This is a noun from 1940. The scattering of radiation or particles in a direction opposite to that of the incident radiation due to reflection from particles of the medium transversed. <clears throat> so, depending on what the radiation is in, is it in water, is it in the air, is it in something else that I can't think of, uh, depending on that, it will backscatter in uh, different ways. And then at the end it says, also, the radiation or particles so reversed in direction. Backscatter is also a verb. Now we have back scratching. There is a hyphen. Uh, this is a noun from 1904. The reciprocal exchange of favors, services, assistance, or praise. You scratch my back, I scratch yours. Now we have back seat. It is all one word. It is a noun from 1780. One, a seat in the back as of an automobile. Number two. An inferior position, as in won't take a back seat to anyone. Now we have back set. It is all one word. It is a noun from 1721, and we just have the synonym, which is interesting. It's the, the words have been flipped, setback. So you could say setback or back set. I have never heard of back set before, which is probably why there's no actual definition for it. Now we have backside. It is all one word. It is a noun from circa 1500. We have the synonym buttocks. Uh, I think that's just a funny word. B-U-T-T-O-C-K-S. And it is often used in plural, so backsides. Now we have backslap. All one word. It is a transitive verb from 1777. To display excessive or effusive goodwill for... Now we have, oh, well, that was the transitive definition, and now here is the intransitive definition. Uh, To display excessive cordiality or goodwill. Backslap is a noun, and so is backslapper. Now we have backslash, all one word. It is a noun from 1982. A mark, and then it shows the backslash, used especially in computer programming. There's also the forward slash, which we'll get to in a few years. Um, But I got to say, I always get confused as to which is the backslash and the forward slash. And when I see them, it makes perfect sense. Um, The the top of the backslash is more on the left side and the bottom is more on the right side. Um, And so it looks like it's leaning back. But depending on your point of view, the forward slash could also look like it's leaning back. but usually we, at least here in uh, American English and, and most other languages, we read left to right. So in the direction that the words are being read or the things that are being typed, uh, it is leaning backwards. So hopefully 
I'll always remember which is the backslash. There's actually a keyboard in front of me. Uh, backslash is the one that is above the enter key on the right side there. Um, and the forward slash is the one that is um, uh, on the same key as the question mark. Okay, <clears throat> enough about keyboards. Let's talk about backslide. This is a verb. Uh, backslide, backslid, backslidden, backsliding. Other, those are other forms. This is from 1552. One, to lapse morally or in the practice of religion. Number two, to revert to a worse condition. Synonym is retrogress. Uh, retrogress, that's a fascinating word. Um, well, there's there's egress, ingress. Uh, I feel like there's something similar to retrogress that I'm not thinking of at the moment. Um Pro, well, pro progress, pro progress. You when you progress, and I, uh, I think that's the one I was thinking of. And retrogress would be, you know, going backwards, back backsliding. Um, but you know, retrogress is not a word that we usually uh, t say. Uh, backslide is a noun, and backslider is also a noun. Now we have backspace. It is the first form. It is all one word. It is a verb from 1911. Uh, this one's actually only intransitive. To move back a space in a text with the press of a key. Oh, look, we got back to the keyboard. Now we have the second form of backspace. It is a noun from 1983. An instance of backspacing. Also, the key pressed in backspacing. And here we have backspin, all one word. It is a noun from circa 1909, a backward rotary motion of a ball. Like if you're uh, shooting a basketball or uh, pool, playing pool, billiards, uh, backspin is used a lot um, in billiards. I could never really do it so well. I've always wanted to be able to control the cue ball better, but uh, I, I've never practiced enough to get good at it. Okay, now we have backsplash, one word. It is a noun from 1947. A vertical surface, as of tiles, designed to protect the wall behind a stove or countertop. Now we have backstabbing. It is a noun from 1946. Betrayal, as by a verbal attack against one not present, especially by a false friend. Backstab is a verb and backstabber is a noun. Uh, yeah, I guess usually it's a false friend, but, you know, they could actually be your friend. They don't have to be a false friend to, to backstab you. Um, they're probably not going to be a friend for very long, though, if that's the case, if that's what they're doing. Backstabbing is not cool. Try not to be a backstabber. If you're going to say something about, say, to uh, about somebody, maybe say it to their face. Uh, talk to them about it. Depending on the situation. Sorry for all the sniffles. I just came in from uh, the... Um, the outside. So this happens. I should probably prepare better. Okay, now we have backstage. It is all one word. It is the first form. It is an adjective from 1916. One of relating to or occurring in the area behind the stage and especially in the dressing rooms. Number two, of or relating to the private lives of theater people. Number three, of or relating to the inner working or operation as of an organization. Now, yeah, here we go with the second form of backstage. It is an adverb from 1922. One, in or to a backstage area. Number two, in private. Synonym is secretly. Next is backstairs. All one word. It is an adjective from 1663. One, we have these synonyms secret and furtive. F-U-R-T-I-V-E, as in backstairs political deals. Number two, we have the synonyms sordid and scandalous, uh, as in backstairs gossip. But there is no definition for the actual backstairs, which are the stairs in a house that are probably near the back door. Okay, number two, uh, no, not number two. Next word is backstay, all one word. It is a noun from 1626. One, a stay extending aft from a masthead. Number two, a strengthening or supporting device at the back, as of a carriage or a shoe. A shoe has a backstay? Okay, didn't know that's what it was called. But I am not a shoemaker, so there you go. Next we have backstitch, it is all one word. Uh, it's a noun from 1611. A stitch sewn one stitch length backward 
on the front side and two stitch lengths forward on the reverse side to form a solid line uh, of stitching on both sides. I, I'm not a sewer or a stitcher, so I'm not familiar with a backstitch, but I bet a lot of you have a lot of experience uh, sewing and stitching and, and such, so uh, you probably know what this is. Backstitch is also a verb. Now we have backstop. It is one word. It is the first form. It's a noun from 1851. One, something at the back serving as a stop, as 1A, a screen or fence for keeping a ball from leaving the field of play. 1B, a stop as a pawl, P-A-W-L, that prevents a backward movement as of a wheel. Number two, a player as the catcher positioned behind the batter. Now we have the second form of backstop. It is a transitive verb. And is there an intransitive? No, just transitive. From 1941. Number one, we have these synonyms support and bolster. Number two, to serve as a backstop to. Number three, to play the position of goalkeeper for. As in, backstop a hockey team. Next is backstory, all one word. It is a noun from 1984, a story that tells what led up to the main story or plot, as of a film. Next is backstreet, all one word. It is a noun from the 15th century, a street away from the main thoroughfares. Next is backstretch. <clears throat> Excuse me. Backstretch, it is a noun from 19, uh, no, 1839, the side opposite the home stretch on a race course. Oh, I never I never really knew that or thought about that. Um I didn't know that the the the, the home stretch that that last sort of straight straight away uh was actually called the home stretch. I mean I didn't I didn't know it was named the home stretch. I never really thought about where that word came from. Um I guess that makes sense. It's the the stretch of the course that where you're coming home, you're coming to the end. Um, and so I guess on the other side of the track, because you, you know it's usually an oval, the other side is the back stretch. I didn't know that. I also don't watch racing uh, of any kind, so I don't pay attention to those things. Um, so there you go. Uh, now we have backstroke. It is a noun from 1879. A swimming stroke executed on the back and usually consisting of alternating circular arm pulls and a flutter kick. Flutter, flutter kick. Uh, backstroker is a noun. Next is backswept. All one word. It is an adjective from circa 1918. Swept or slanting backward. And our last word for this episode is back swimmer. All one word. It is a noun from 1862. An aquatic bug uh, that swims on its back. What? Why does it swim on its back? Why wasn't it made to swim on its front? Uh, and its scientific family name is Notonectidae. N-O-T-O-N-E-C-T-I-D-A-E. Uh, you can probably tell that my energy is a little bit low today. Uh, I'm not talking extra as much, although I am trying to not talk as much just because I think some people uh, don't like as much interjections. Um, also, I'm just tired. I've only been up for two or three hours, um, and uh, I'm tired. So, what is the word of the episode? Uh, you know, there were a lot of words in this one. Um... Yeah, no editing. I don't know if you're aware, but back in October, I started to do no editing. I might go back on that. I'm not sure. Uh, I was editing an outtakes uh, thing that's going to go up on, on Patreon. It's going to be an exclusive episode there. Um, and I thought it was very funny. Uh, I haven't finished editing it yet at the time of recording at least. Um, but it was a lot of fun to come across all of these silly outtakes that caught, got cut out because I was actually doing editing. Um, anyway, this is all to stall to help me figure out a word, and I'm not even paying attention to them. So we are going to pick... Um, where where did it go? Uh, backslash as the word of the episode uh, because of reasons. 
And uh, that's it. Oh, so I said I was going to talk a little bit more about my foot here. Uh, so if you're done with me, you, if you don't want to hear about my life, go ahead and turn this off. Um, so uh, let's see. A week and a half ago, I was working and something very heavy fell on my foot. This is the short story. Um, it punctured my foot. I have two puncture wounds. Uh, I went to an urgent care no, they took x-rays. I found out a couple days later there were no fractures, so that's good. Um, but they did give me seven staples to close up those wounds. There was a, a part of the skin that got pulled off as well, which later, um, as it was healing, I realized looked like a T-Rex's head, a, t- a Tyrannosaurus Rex's head with its mouth wide open, um, and it had staples on it as well. Um, so that was a week and a half ago, January 15th. That's when this all happened. Uh, I've been on crutches since then. Um, I actually just right before recording, I was at the doctor's office and I got the staples out. So it's been a full week and a half that I've been dealing with this. Um, what do I got to say about it? Uh, the staples came out. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, but it also wasn't great. Uh, and I'm still going to stay on the crutches. Um, uh, uh, for probably the next week just because my foot is still uh, swollen and bruised and feels kind of numb uh, in parts and so it's the nerves I'm, I'm sure are still healing uh, but anyway that's the short story of this uh, maybe the next time I record which is probably going to be four or five episodes from now um, I will have more news to share about my foot healing Um, All right, I have talked enough. Thank you very much for listening, and until next time, this is Some Silly Person Reading the Dictionary. Uh, Goodbye.